interactive performance is exactly what it sounds like. It's a performance in which you get to interact with the audience. What instrument is this? Just call it out. Clarinet, yeah, you all know. We actually get to talk with the audience, invite them up, and sometimes we ask them what they want us to do. There are these huge red rock walls, and there's birds, and there's coyotes. It means that every concert is going to be different, because every audience is going to be different. What can we do? Um, what should we do? How can we get them to have a lifelong relationship with music? When we start to create our interactive performances, you either pick a piece of music that will serve kind of as a focal work, or you pick what we call an entry point, a theme for the concert. When we first started trying to come up with programs for the IPs, they are based on specific repertoire that was already existing for the given instrumentation. For example, my first group was a wind quintet, and that was really easy. We found all wind quintet music. By the time my last group was formed, we had clarinet, horn, cello, and viola. And there's nothing for that instrumentation. So what we got to do was choose a topic that resonated with all of us, that we wanted to share. The theme that my most recent interactive performance group came up with was how to show that composers write music to portray specific landscapes or settings. How do they shape a scene with classical music? And that's how we chose the music that we wanted. We arranged really large orchestra pieces for that ensemble. So today we're talking about music that describes a specific place in the world and how we can write and create that music ourselves. After you do this a few times, you realize anything can be an interactive performance. But what you have to do is, is really think thoughtfully about how people are going to respond to that. So what I want you to do right now is close your eyes and we're going to continue playing this piece by an American composer named Aaron Copeland. And I want you to close your eyes and picture a landscape as we play. Imagine yourself in this landscape. I want you to look around you. Do you see any objects? Any trees? Maybe a lake? Or a beach? Any mountains? Now I'll take some ideas of what you all saw when your eyes were closed. What did you see? Yeah. You saw a lake? Nice, yeah? I think it got people really interested in listening to what music is actually portraying. So one of the easiest ways to create music that sounds like a specific place is to imitate the sounds that you would already hear in that place. And there's a composer who is very famous for doing this. He's a French composer named Olivier Messiaen. And one of the places that really inspired him was this place in Utah called Bryce Canyon National Park. The wind coming through the canyon sounds something like this. And the sound of a rainstorm sounds like this. During today's program, we are actually all going to create a brand new piece of music based on a place, just like we were talking about. What we would do is ask them for a place that they wanted to compose the music about. In the orange shirt? Australia, that's a good one. Australia, any other ideas in the back? The Arctic. You know what? I think in honor of the snowflakes that we walked through this morning to come to visit you guys, Let's do the Arctic. And then we ask for sounds that would be heard in that place. Yes. Heavy wind, that's a good one. And? Seals. Well, seals, is that what you said? Okay, great. So does someone have an idea for a sound you could make for heavy wind?
Good idea. Can you show us what that sounded like, Ms. Weiner? So let's practice our wind Sounds sound. Good. Okay, who would like to demonstrate their seal noise? That sounds pretty good to Pretty me. good seal. But I think we should probably add a few more elements. So another way composers can create music that sounds like the landscape is to actually make it sound exactly how the landscape looks. You can actually play a melody that mimics a line almost exactly. We're cold, we're lonely, and probably there's kind of a feeling of emptiness because there's not a lot of things around us, right? So we're gonna try and make a texture for the music. That's kind of the background or the energy of the music that will capture that spirit. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. We're going to start out with our texture, and then we're going to bring in our arctic melody, which Kimberly drew, and then we're going to add in our sound effects. We have our lovely volunteer, Sandra, who's going to be leading. Okay, so we're, are you guys ready for our world here right? of our arctic, <laughs> PS21Q arctic composition? They got to feel real ownership over the performance that happened as a result of their ideas. <laughs> it worked really well for elementary school kids. And then the same music worked for middle school and high school kids. We just had to change the way we phrased things or take out activities that would be a little bit too pedantic for high school students that we did with the elementary school kids. The main thing that I took from interactive performances was that it takes a lot of patience to teach. And I also learned that it is among the most rewarding professions that you could be a part of. It has really changed my approach to what a concert experience is like for an audience member. Not to say that every concert is an educational, kind of pedagogical experience, but that people need something to latch on to. And I think that can happen at Carnegie Hall on a Friday night for a subscription concert, and that can happen in the school auditorium. It's the musician's job to kind of honor that part of that relationship. That's something that the interactive performances really hit home for us as performers. It's rewarding for the audience, and it's also rewarding for us.